Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks to the uh, Asian Pacific American Awareness Conference. Um, so, yes, um, I, um, I was actually asked here by my assistant who's in the back. Her name is Avita Wong. She's taping right now. And Avita is a former UCI graduate. And uh, she insisted I come down to her alma mater <laughs> and speak here. And obviously, we were really excited. We were really pleased that we were invited. Um, so, as Clive said, um, I am the founder of Formosa Films and a producer of the movie Formosa Betrayed. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about my background. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, Taiwanese American. Uh, I was born and raised in Kansas. And uh, so one of the things that my parents insisted that uh, we call ourselves was Taiwanese and not Chinese. And um, in Kansas, that always just got kind of this blank stare. <laughs> because people didn't really know the difference between Taiwanese and Chinese, or all they knew was that you were Asian, <laughs> or Oriental, or whatever they thought you were. And um, so, so kind of growing up, I didn't really think much about um, being Taiwanese or even being Asian American, because 99% of my classmates were Caucasian. So, um, so it wasn't, um, you know, and, and, and also growing up, I also noticed that there weren't a lot of role models. There weren't people who represented us, either in politics or in entertainment. Like, I never saw a major Asian face on television or in film or any, anyone that I could recognize in any case. And so, uh, you know, I kind of grew up having to be, be that representation, I mean, to my friends, to my community. And so, uh, a lot of people ask me kind of how I got into this business and how it all started. I would say that that probably started because of, of where I'm from and how I grew up. Um, but because my parents were, were political dissidents, I mean, pretty clearly, they, they, like I said, they insisted that they call themselves Taiwanese. So uh, I always grew up and I had a real passion for politics. And, um, and so when I was in school, when I was uh, your age, I was an international relations major. And uh, I went to Tufts University. Um, and I did a junior year in Paris, and then I did a Fulbright scholarship, and then I did, I did graduate school at Columbia uh, for Masters in International Affairs. And, um, and, and after that, I went to work uh, for the Clinton administration in the Labor Department, and then eventually worked in Congress as a lobbyist and various things. And my last job was actually working with the U.S. Trade Representative's Office, which is uh, part of the White House, and this was under the Bush administration. And what we would do is we would go and uh, they would hire us to negotiate international trade agreements. Um, so, so basically, my career had been pretty set. I was going down kind of the political road, and that was kind of what I was trained to do. That's what I went to school to do. And uh, when I was your age, and, and even then, I, I don't think I ever imagined that I would become a filmmaker. It wasn't even in my sight line. Um, but uh, what, what happened was, when I was working in DC, I was working at the Labor Department, I took, uh, I took an acting class. And uh, it was kind of all over after that. <laughs> uh, after that, I, I was asked to do a play, uh, and then I was seen by an agent, and then they put me in a TV show, and then they put me in commercials, and then in films. And I thought, gosh, everybody says this acting thing is so hard, but this is like, really easy. Uh, what I didn't realize is that there aren't a lot of agents in the DC market. <laughs> and so I was just booking everything left and right. And it was a lot, it just seemed like so much fun. It was so easy. It was so different than what my day job was, basically working for either Clinton or for Bush. And so finally, you know, I got to a point in my career where I had to turn down acting work because I was, I was getting, booking a lot, a lot of shows. And I, I finally got to a point where I had to basically make a choice. You know, either I'm going to continue this political career or I'm going to go on, on basically, you know, this acting route, my, which, is, which was my dream. And I was just like, and I, I couldn't figure out how to actually do it, like how to, how to, how to make that happen. And I, I slowly, you know, I met a lot of people along the way, a lot of mentors along the way who kind of showed me uh, what that would be, and I, I began to, you know, uh, take some time off. I started going to New York, started auditioning, and then finally, you know, I just had, I, I just took the plunge. I just said, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. 
And, um, and this was back in 2002. So uh, about now eight years ago, seven, seven eight years ago. And um, uh, I moved up to New York. I started uh, studying with a very famous acting coach named Susan Batson, who, um, uh, I mean, she, she's, Nicole, she's known as Nicole Kidman's coach, but she's also coached Tom Cruise and, and Juliette Binoche and, and a ton of stars. Uh, and I started working with her, and then, and then she opened up the studio in LA, and I came out there. And, uh, you know, obviously, all of a sudden, now I was in a different, a really different world. Uh, it wasn't like in DC where I was getting offers left and right. Now, I was doing what every Asian American actor does, which is you go to auditions, and there's a hundred people who look like you at these auditions, and it's all for Chinese waiter number two. <laughs> it's, it's really, really bad stuff. I mean, most of the auditions I went on, uh, most of the parts that are out there are really, really bad. I mean, that's just the truth of what's going on in Hollywood. And the reason for that is because no one's writing stuff for us. No one's writing material, no one's creating material that's, uh, that stars Asian American. There's, there's always one or two that, that like pop up here and there, but it wasn't like, especially like in that time period, 2003 through 2005, you know, there wasn't a ton of stuff. So, um, so basically, I, um, a friend of mine wrote a piece that we did for the theater um, that, that did really well. And we decided to turn that into a short film. And the reason we decided to do that, I wanted to do it, um, it was a romantic comedy. And, um, and for, for once, I was going to get to play a romantic lead, and I never thought I would ever get to play that, because those Asian males don't get that chance to play a romantic lead. And it's called A Starbucks Story. And, um, and basically, we produced it. And we, we, she wrote it, uh, I co-wrote it with her, we produced it, we, we got it done. And then, originally it was just for us to show to agents and managers, and we decided why not, let's just put on the film festival circuit. And literally the firm, first film festival, we won. We won, we won best short, we won best film, we won the audience award, we won every award at that film festival. We were like, whoa! <laughs> like, that, that wasn't what we were expecting, we were just, you know, we were just there to kind of do something for ourselves. And uh, because of that film, then another director, producer, saw it and asked me to produce his feature-length film. Now, keep in mind, I have a political background. I didn't grow up as a filmmaker. I don't have a film degree. So for me, all of a sudden, I had a chance to produce a feature film. And I was like, OK, so, and then, which I did. And then all of a sudden, I had two films. I had a short film, and I had a feature. And I was like, wow, well, if I'm going to be doing this for other people, I, I feel like I want to do it for me. I want to do it for myself, and I want to tell a story that I really believe in. And so, you know, ha coming from, you know, they always say when you're when you're starting to create something, you're starting to write something. Write write about what you know. Write write about write about something you, you feel or, or care passionately about. And and the only thing I could think of was, you know, well, I thought of my parents. I thought of my parents' story about coming from Taiwan. And and like I said, they had always called themselves Taiwanese and they had always insisted on it, and they had gotten in trouble for it. They had been blacklisted, and they had been harassed, and, and they had friends who had much worse things happen to them, like they were jailed and they were tortured, and some of them, in high-profile cases, there were even murders. And I thought, wow, this is, a, this is stuff most people don't know. So I, I, I started to create this, this story um, about, and I did all the research, and I, I researched the historical facts, and basically what it came down to was, I, I created this story set in the early 80s about an FBI detective who's investigating the murder of a Taiwanese professor at a small Midwestern school. It turns out the professor has been spied upon by his students, and those students are being hired by the government of Taiwan. So through a series of events, he chases the killers to Taiwan. He finds out that the killers are Chinese mafia hired by the government to kill political dissidents in the U.S that it goes to the top of the government in Taiwan and that the U.S. government knows about it but doesn't want to do anything because of the U.S.-Taiwan-China 